Sometimes I think I live in a gap between two worlds. One world that I have to wake up to, be adherent of the rules and live in a place that is dictated by others. A place I sometimes feel the fear of aging and dying before I have figured out what it is I am here to do. That other world is sweet, fresh and misty, inviting adventure into the unknown, melding ancient wisdom with new discovery, the sunlight turning into moonlight, and the spell of eternal life is never broken. Perhaps in that gap, I should repair the forgotten bridge from one side to the other. But truth be told, I don't want to. I don't want to because I don't have the energy to fix what is broken within. I am a wild, wandering nomad. I belong everywhere and nowhere, all at the same time. And in that gap between worlds, I am free. Rita Clint. Welcome to the Lost Traveler podcast. I'm your ever-loving host, Henry Cameron Allen. And today I am excited to meet a new friend and have her join me as kind of a co-host for the Lost Traveler podcast, uh, Jennifer Monroe. She is an ADHD academic coach, life coach, digital nomad, uh, uh, thunder bunny mama, and you love pe to lift people up and, and help them achieve their the vision of their best life. Is that is that accurate? Welcome. Well, thank you. Yes, that is accurate. I've my goal is to help people see that there are all sorts of wonderful ways to be productive and successful and happy. No matter who you are. No matter who you are. Absolutely. Where did your journey begin? You're a digital nomad. So what was the first what was the first step on into this life that because I'm a digital nomad too. I, I'm familiar with the my process, but everyone's got a different story. Um my story kind of starts out a little rocky. I was leaving an unsuccessful marriage. Not to worry though, we're friends. We're you know, found our happiness separate from each other. But when I left, I realized I didn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> I, my house uh, was rented out and I had six months to kill. And I said, I don't, what should I do? And I thought, well, I'll just drive around the country and visit my friends and family. I work online. I don't have to do that in the house. So I'm just going to go visiting. As I traveled, I started investigating. Um, I started joining Facebook groups and meeting other digital nomads on the road. And the more I explored, the more I liked it. And then winter was coming. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go to Quartzsite, Arizona and meet the tribe. It's where everybody gathers in the winter. And I said, I, before I make my decision, I am going to go meet everybody. And all the way there, I kept telling myself, it's not going to be as good as you think. Lower your expectations. This is not <laughs> summer camp. I got there and it was better than I thought. And it was exactly like summer camp. So this is um, a, this is a place where, Digital nomads from all around the United States, or is it North America? Or all around the North America. Okay. Uh, we wow. get Canadians. Um, we get a lot of people. It's a small town in Arizona with a population of about 2,000. But in the winter, up to 2 million van lifers, RVers, adventurers descend on this teeny little town. And they fill the desert. And it is an amazing sight. Wow. See, I'm a global digital nomad. So I'm not around. I did a little bit around North America uh, over the last, I don't know, maybe. Well, I was I was based in Gloucester, Massachusetts for about 10 years. I had a folkloric theater company there. 
And uh, then I went off on this adventure that took me to the UK and around Europe and, and eventually landed me here in Spain. Um, but I did go back to the States for about seven months, actually to Arizona, but I've never heard of this gathering. It must be like Burning Man. <laughs> it sort of is. Um, there's actually a convention called the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous the RTR wow. and um, if you've ever seen the movie Nomadlands I did that's where she goes when she goes to the desert and it started out just as some people helping each other let me teach you how to do something and now it's a big convention and it gets bigger each year wow. and it's an amazing place to be with just the coolest people from all over. What do you say in your experience now? How long have you been doing this? Uh, a little over a year. Okay, so you've met so quite I'm, a few people, I'm sure. Along I the have. Way. Is there a common ground that everyone sort of shares in this broader and broadening community? We're all a little weird. <laughs> We're <Amen>. all <laughs> right. We're all a little off from what my, most people would call mainstream life. We're just we want something a little different. Maybe we're looking for something. Maybe we're leaving something. Maybe we're just existing in the moment, but we've decided that you know sticks and bricks as we call it it's just not for us wow now do you live in your jeep during your travels or do you stop at motels and bunny, um, bunny well, <laughs> um i live in my jeep and my trailer it's uh you'll have to picture a pioneer trailer um from you know like the crossing the country except it's bright blue mm -hmm. and it's just big enough for a little bed and a couple shelves just enough for me and my bunny and yeah we live in a little teeny trailer wow do you find that it's easy to find places to park and and camp out i've heard from a number of friends who have who have lived that lifestyle that sometimes it's really hard actually that people are not welcoming to nomadic um yeah absolutely there's you're either gonna be parking rich or parking poor mm. if you're out in the west there's so much federal land that they want you to camp on they want you to enjoy the country that's why they take your taxes but when you get east there's just less land and more cities mm -hmm. and it's harder to find places to stay although you'd be surprised nowadays rest stops and part and uh truck stops are actually really nice nowadays they are They're, you know they are and you can stay overnight at those places you can't stay for days but right, you can stay right. overnight they're great when you're on the road and you're trying to get some place uh, but for long-term stays there it gets a little hard sometimes but the places that are available are so beautiful mm -hmm. and so amazing i spent um about a month up near williams reservoir williams fork reservoir in Colorado and just sat by the reservoir and enjoyed life. That's so great. It's a dream for some people, a nightmare for others. I know that there have been there have been issues of safety, um, especially as a as a single person traveling alone, other than your Thunder Bunny, God of the Universe, or whatever, you know. What is his name? 
Thor the Thunder Bunny, Traveler of the Universe. There you go. I love you. Have you written a children's book? And if you haven't, why? I have, <laughs> why? I have not. Um, I have thought about it, though, because Thor has had a lot of adventures. Mm -hmm. He has been all across this country and back again several times. And you'd be surprised. He loves being in the car. He stands up like a dog with and looks out the window <laughs> and watches the world go by. That's and amazing. when we stop, he comes out and, hi, I want to meet everybody. And he lets everyone pet him. How old is he? He's getting older. He's eight already. Wow. Which is kind of old for a small bunny. But he's had an amazing life. A guy wire is a tensioned cable that is designed to enhance the stability of a freestanding structure. Think of me as your guy wire in terms of life skills mentoring. You're perfectly capable of standing stably on your own two feet, but I'm a cable that can enhance your stability. I'm available for individual or couples counseling, life skills mentorship, child loss grief support, LGBTQ plus support. I can also officiate weddings, end of life ceremonies, baby namings, invocations, or whatever guidance you may need. I serve all genders, all ages. Sessions are affordable, discreet, private, and conducted online. Find me at guy-wire.org. Book your appointment today. Greetings, greetings, greetings. I'm Queen B. Divine. The cure is conversation. And where can you find me? At bluntreflections.com, where I will be talking to guests from around the world that not only share their time, but their insights and their tips on how they became the best version of who they were meant to be. So if you're looking for a great story and a great time, check me out at bluntreflections.com. The cure is conversation. And remember, blase, blase means to tell your story. I, I also travel with an animal companion. Oh, what do you uh, travel with? He's actually my service dog. Uh, I'm, I'm disabled. I have a bad nerve in my leg and uh, he helps me with um, going upstairs and downstairs, helps me with balance, uh, you know, going up and down steep inclines and things like that. Or if I'm sitting in a low seat, he'll help me I don't put pressure on him, but he he leverages, he helps leverage me to get out of my my low seat if I'm feeling weak on my side. But um he is his name is Flat Stanley, and he is uh a rescue from Mississippi. He was going to be a uh, a bait dog. Do you know what those are? No. In the deep south, they are still illegal, um, but very popular fighting dog fighting rings. Oh. and for gambling and these bait dogs are young dogs that are thrown into the ring as practice for the fighter oh. and it's a horrific thing to even think about uh oh, i'm so glad he's with you now and a little plug for my friends at sweet paws rescue they are based in gloucester in cape ann massachusetts and they take vans down into the deep south and like indiana jones rescue from very, you know, and sometimes very dangerous situations. They oh, rescue the yeah. litters of puppies. And so they bring them to Cape Ann Animal Aid in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is no no kill shelter. And they're adopted. And I had just lost two dogs. One lived to be 18 and the other 20. And they were my pack. You know, we were joined at the hip they saw me through the loss of my son to brain cancer and you know they were the last vestige of our core family and when they passed on i was like what am i going to do do i really want to get another dog and i was thinking about traveling more and and then i had a dream 
And in the dream, I walked into this nondescript building and there were no windows anywhere. There were no doors. It was just a long hallway. And I turned and looked to the right and there was this giant wall size poster. And at the top in big black letters, it said, did you know? Question mark. And at the bottom, it said, it's the law, period. And everything in between was about service dogs. And I had never, I mean, I'm disabled. I've had multiple back surgeries and, and it caused, you know, damage to my leg nerve. But I also have been uh, diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I went and talked to my doctors and I said, I had this dream about service dogs and I've never considered that as an option for me. Do you think it might be helpful? And they said, absolutely. Why didn't we think of that, right? So I got my letters from my doctors and I went to adopt, I went to Cape Ann Animal Aid and there was this little pup. They had just arrived, he and his five siblings. And I never give an animal a name. They already know their name. You just have to learn their language and ask, right? So I said, what's your name, little pup? And he spluted. Do you know what spluting is? Oh, no, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> That's a great word. That's um, a great word. It's something that is an inbred behavior in cattle dogs and other herding dogs where they, you've seen it happen. They, they spread their front paws and their back paws completely out like roadkill, their head down, you know, yeah. and they, they're like a, you know, a bare rug. They just flatten themselves out to avoid getting kicked by a cow, right? Okay. And so I said, when I asked him his name, he spread himself out, he spluted and looked up at me with these gorgeous eyes and said, my name's Flat Stanley. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so Flat Stanley was his name and he Aww. shared that with me. And he was only three or four months when I adopted him. Aww. And uh, I went to, to pay the bill. Um, and the woman behind the desk said, you're Henry Allen, right? I said, yeah. She said, your money's no good here. I said, what? She said, somebody called. They prefer to remain anonymous. Jen, if it was you, I say, thank you. I mean, we're only here <laughs> now, but I say this to everybody. But they said, somebody called and said, Henry Allen, if he comes in looking for a dog, he just lost his dogs. And if uh, he comes in, we're covering the bill, so. Isn't that just? Oh my gosh! And now Flat Stanley is gonna—he's gonna turn six on Halloween. So we've been. Oh, wow! He's the first dog in history ever to be allowed to the top of the Eiffel Tower. I mean, I need to write a joke. Really? <laughs> oh, you gotta get he Stanley. He must have had him. some great adventures. He really, really has. He loves traveling in the car. He loves trains. He's been on boats, ferries. We took a ferry from Wales to Ireland. We've did, but done road trips, mm -hmm. buses, planes, train. I mean, everything. And he's the best. So I get it. Long story short. Um, so, so getting into how you got into uh, coaching and uh, ADHD specifically, mentoring and and. Uh, helping out what do you what led you to that well I I have bipolar disorder too um and there was a time where I was very sick I was bedridden I was a nervous wreck I couldn't leave my house wow. and it was taking a toll on my marriage on my relationship with my family on everything and I was actually on the internet and I found a chart that listed how much time you would lose to any particular mental illness and that included being sick going to the doctor doing your therapy right. all of it rolled together how much time would you lose and it said that people with bipolar would lose about 40% of their life. Wow. And that could have been devastating. That could have just really thrown me into a bad place. But I found that my reaction to that was, well, then I better get out there and start living that other 60%. Damn right. I can watch Star Trek when I'm sick. 
<laughs> exactly. And How did you know? What, what was the indication of, of when you knew? This is a very personal question, so you don't have to answer, but I'm really curious. And we have listeners in 35 countries around the world. And so um, I know that there are people out there who are dealing with whatever diagnosis or undiagnosed mental illness. Um, how did you know that something was wrong and how did you go about it? <laughs> if that makes sense. I, I, it makes total sense. I actually started becoming seriously symptomatic when I was 13. Wow. Um, I knew something was wrong when the school said, um, there's something very, very wrong here. and We're going to send you home because you are not emotionally able to deal with school. And they don't do that very often. <laughs> they really like you to be at school. Yeah. And it was, it just became part of who I was. I, looking back, I can see symptoms of childhood mental health issues. Was it rage? I, I mean, how did it manifest? Was it rage or sadness or weeping or shyness? It was a sadness and terror hmm. mixed together with bouts of rage um i tend to have mixed episodes which it doesn't give you the super high i'm gonna go out and gamble and drink and do drugs it gives you this anger mm. this seething anger that just it wasn't just adolescent hormonal no it was, it was very much different it was bigger than that. And I was very lucky. I had a wonderful vice principal who took me under her wing and sort of, and our vice principal moved with us from grade to grade. So I had her from seventh grade to 12th. Wow. And she took a personal interest in me. She paid attention to how I was doing in school, to what I was doing after school, to my family that. life, which she didn't have to do. Right. And I'm so glad she did. Balance, pain mitigation, range of motion, athletic performance, focus, memory, immune system support, and REM level of sleep all this and more made possible affordably with no pharmaceuticals, no injections or invasive treatments. Just socks, insoles and patches made stronger with the tactile patterning of Vox Life products. Scientifically proven to work and guaranteed. Now in the USA, Canada and the UK, Visit www.dianedinkmeyer.voxlife.com. That's Vox, V O double X, life. You'll be glad you did. Was your family supportive? Both of that, My family but also, also your situation? did the best they could with what they had. Amen. My, <laughs> my older brother has very, very severe ADHD, the uh, level of which he is unable to live an independent life. Wow. And my father has very severe ADHD, not quite as bad as my brother, but has never been able to settle down or keep a job is it and it is there is a hereditary component to it and while i don't have adhd i do have executive functioning disorders from my bipolar tell me a little bit about that what do you mean by executive so your executive functioning is your it's pretty much your foundation for being able to function. It is your concept of time, your memory, your ability to focus, your ability to self-regulate or self-motivate, and your ability to control your emotions. 
And without these skills, without these abilities, life can be really hard. Yeah. Because they are executive. They are the foundation for everything else you do. And I'm sure there must be different intensities and levels of, of challenge, right? With every challenge Absolutely. comes opportunity, though. And yes, that's why I wanted to talk to you because I know that in our time, you know, which is the only time we live in, right? We can't go back 10 years and make any changes or fix or change anything. We can't project ourselves into the future. Right now is all we've got. And I know that there are many, many people who are walking the earth. There were now 8 billion people on the earth. Most parents are not equipped with a toolkit of even the most essential, basic universal life skills like mental health, like communication skills, like financial literacy, like emotional literacy, like sexual literacy, uh, nutrition, hygiene, grief, right? right. Uh, all levels of grief, right? And, and, and where do young people go for these? skills to to for, find proficiency they're very limited they're not getting them at school either and they're not getting it where are they getting them? they're getting them on youtube they're getting them on the internet or watching the world around them and just gleaning what what do you see because i see a lot more of these things that you're talking about the list of those executive uh skills i'm seeing well, some of it i think we know more about it so right. we can identify it before it was just oh that's weird uncle to harry right. you know and we would just insulate our families would insulate around the person who needed help that's right and we live in a more global community now which has its pros and cons there are some great places on youtube I love YouTube. I'm a huge fan. Can you give me some of those? I'll put them in the uh, description. Absolutely. So I will. Look at if you have some favorite ones. Or I do books. have some favorite ones. And I, and there are some great, there is some great stuff out there. There's wonderful resources, but they are hard to find. Yeah. And they're hard for parents to find. Right. Um, you know, but if your child is suffering, if you're noticing that there's something wrong, there are tutors, there are coaches, there are counselors, there are mentors. There are so many people out there who want to help. That's right. That's the basis for this podcast is finding those help yeah. in the world and, and having these conversations so people don't feel like they're alone. You know, I grew right. up in the 70s, I'm 56 now and no tools were available and especially my parents being diplomats we were overseas there was no internet there were no resources at school or at the embassy for foreigners you know who were dealing with mental health issues and parents could only rely on the tools that they had like you said they did the best they could with the tools they had and if that meant someone's father breaking a switch off a tree and whipping his child till they bled as discipline, saying, I love what you in one know? ear, you know, and then that child growing up to say, well, this is what I learned that discipline is. And it's not a question of discipline, mental health. It's not. And so no, it's absolutely the, not the great divide that causes so much deeper trauma than it needs to be, especially in our day and age. And I was able to very young, as I'm sure you probably were, able to sort of with the right people, with the right mentors showing up at the right time to take our hand and say, I'm not gonna hurt you, it's okay, um, to guide us through those tender adolescent years when we are also on top of everything else hormonal um, I'm trying to figure out who we are. Um, I was able to realize from a young age that if they knew better, they would do better, my parents. And I was able to forgive yeah. them for that. 
And my mother did some things that were amazing and ahead of her time. Right. Um, she made sure I had a safe space. Um, no matter how much, how angry she was at me or how much trouble I was in, she never yelled at me in my room. Mm. My room was a sanctuary. Wow. Now she'd call me down and yell at me in the kitchen, right. but she never invaded that space. And my mother gave me the best advice and the advice I give a lot of my students, which is these are absolutely not the best years of your life. Right. Exactly. <laughs> oh. oh, it was an amazing weight off of me. I was like 14 and she sat me down and she said, I know you're in a lot of pain. And I know people keep telling you, you need to stop it so that, because these are the best years of your life. And they're not, they're going to get better after you get through this period. Every year is going to be better than the one before. And there have been some ups and downs in my life, but as a general rule, she was right. Every year of my life has been better than the one before. That's such an important affirmation for now, and no matter where you are in your life, even if you're 70, <laughs> you know, or if it you're still 17, keeps getting better. it's the same. You, you have to live there. And yeah. because that's what you manifest. If you know that to be true for yourself, then you'll start to see things manifest, don't you? On your terms, on your terms. Yes, and that's a big part of it. We spend so much time trying to live on other people's terms, accepting other people's definitions that we make ourselves miserable mm. because it's just not who we are. My grandmother used to say, honey, labels are for food cans. <laughs> Human beings are far too complex for anybody's label. When you label yourself this, that, or the other thing, you're opening up to everyone else's interpretation of what it means to be you. And only you know you, she said. So let your name be labeled enough. Let them get to know your good name. People should smile when they hear your name. Be a good person first, right? I learned I that. that. At, how old was I? I must have been 17 or 18 when she said that to me. And that was That's, a huge tool for my kid, let me tell you. I bet it is. Pivotal. Yes. What, was, what, were, what were some pivotal moments for you in your journey? Wow. Um, so I think uh, my mother sitting me down and telling me, <laughs> this is just going to suck for five years. <laughs> but if you get through it, you there's a reward at the end. Um, some pivotal moments. I... Hmm. Boy, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to answer now. If it comes to you, you can. Yeah, start. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I think love putting that. people on the spot. I love it. <laughs> I I know there's a good answer in there. <laughs> I'm just not sure what it is at the moment. Shadow and Light LLC was established by Dave Roberts and Reverend Patty Farino co-authors of When the Psychology Professor Met the Minister. Their mission is to empower individuals to transcend life challenges by integrating spiritual practices with psychology to achieve peace. They are available for individualized spiritual counseling, virtual or in-person presentations and workshops to universities, organizations, and other interested groups, virtual or in-person book club meetings. For further information, go to psychologyprofessorandminister.com. So you went on to university after high school. Was that I did. was that difficult for you given your your high school journey? Actually, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. Um we sometimes people with ADHD or people on the spectrum or people who have other learning issues, they're discouraged from going to college. They're like, you won't do well because you have to monitor yourself. You have to be more independent than we think you can be. 
it that's the place I want to get my students to um, because that independence can be a blessing Yeah, with a little help. You now have the chance to define who you are. And if math isn't your thing, don't do math. If you know, you want to be a cheerleader, go be a cheerleader. And it doesn't have the restrictiveness that, that high school has. Um, I recommend for a lot of my students that they go part-time, that they try community college, um, that they explore their options. College and that freedom really helped me. Um, it let me be myself and it let me experiment with who I was. Myself changed a lot in yeah, college. It does. It does. And that's a great place to explore who you are. The academics you are. are really minor when it they comes are. to your undergrad years, I found. And I was lucky because I did not know growing up that I had dyscalculia, which is like a, a numeric autism. Right? I can't conceive numbers in my head. So I failed every math class I ever took in my life. But then I went to university and they were looking at my transcript and they said, you really suck at math, don't you? <laughs> I, luckily, I had somebody who talked to me on that level. And I, I said, yeah, I really do. I've never passed a math class in my life. And, and that was actually a, a source of abuse in my house too that I didn't so it was it had a lot of baggage attached to it and they said uh oh well you know we have a class here for people like you and it's called introduction to logic it's basically the concepts of mathematics using words and not numbers and I aced it I have no issue with logic it's just something doesn't connect with numbers and they tested me for dyscalculia and I and I had it. They, they said it's it's black and white. So, you know, I was able to look back with compassion and say, they didn't know. They didn't know. They thought it was a discipline issue. And they thought that, you know, making me do every math problem in the math book without sleep, without eating, sitting at my desk, if I would nod off. My hair would be yanked back and, and I would be jarred awake to do these math problems. So that did not help <laughs> the issue. Uh, and, my, and my bedroom was not a sacred space. I think that's a really important message to all parents out there is that your children need a sacred space. And so many will discipline their kids by saying, go to your room, right? right. We didn't even, we weren't allowed to have locks on our doors. The locks were removed. So we didn't have a way to protect ourselves. It could happen at any time. That door would come flying open and you never knew. And so it's a really important thing, I think, in terms when we're talking about life skills, universal life skills, child raising is also in that conversation. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And we all and you're have right. the opportunity. To raise our in the in the seventies was really hard for everybody. Uh, my brother's your age; I'm four years younger. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, "Oh, your child is hyperactive; therefore, you must be a bad parent." Right. And they put Ew. my yes. And so now my mom's dealing with that guilt and she's trying to raise three children by herself and her middle child is in and out of mental hospitals. Wow. I can't, I'm not going to say my mother was the best parent ever, but oh my God, considering what she went through, she did an amazing job. And I can also look back through time and say, she did better than her parents. Yes. And what else can you ask from a person? Do you ever have clients who say, oh, well, I think this because that's how I was raised? Sure. I get that, that all the time. 
What's your what's <laughs> your do. what's your comeback to that? Speaking of doing better than you were taught, it's not actually the my clients or my students, as I call them. It's usually their parents. Mm. Um, oh well, you know I was raised. You know, if you didn't do your chores, then you got punished. Okay. and you didn't do well in school there was consequences and sometimes we have to look at that and I have to act as an interpreter between parent and child and say well did you enjoy that was that healthy for you do you look back on your childhood with happy memories and who's raising you and now <laughs> and who's and is that what you want for your child yeah okay you know grandpa used to get a switch and you know give you good hiding but it, you didn't like that that upset you that you know made your life harder why would you do that to your child? And a lot of parents have that, well, I had to do it, so they have to do it. And it's under, and it, what's hard about it, one of the many things that's hard about it is that they are saying to you as they are beating you or whipping you or burning you or cutting you, whatever, pinching you, they're saying, I, this hurts me more than it hurts you. They're saying, I'm doing this because I love you. And so what I was able to discover for my own survival was the recognition that, and, and right or wrong, it was what got me through, that I never doubted their love for me, ever, in, in spite of all that. And if something is coming from a loving place, even if it's a sick, twisted interpretation of love, it's forgivable. Love is forgivable yeah. in all its forms. And that's what got me through. Now, do I condone the behavior? Did I do any of those things to my child? Absolutely not. Never in a million years would I lay a finger on a child. And it's much more everything really to do with the adult, not with the child who's exhibiting the behaviors that are triggering the parent it's the parent's trigger it's not the child's responsibility right what do you think i absolutely agree <laughs> i absolutely agree and we do we'll accept any as humans we want love that's that's one of the driving forces in our life once we have food and shelter the next thing we want is love and we will accept a lot in order to get it in order to feel like we belong with whoever we're with, with our family, with our community, with our religious organization. We will go about? through a lot. Why? Why do you think, why do I think we do that? Well, humanity, I mean, it goes back to the beginning. I don't think you can live without love. I think you could have everything else you need in life if you are not loved if you don't feel that love you're not something's going to be wrong with you you can't function in this world without your parents if you don't have that you you turn to your siblings your extended family if you don't get it there you turn to your pet or your stuffed animal people crave love so much and unfortunately for a lot of people it's very elusive it is especially people like me and you who are out in the world on our own except we're not on our own because we have our animals but we also you know we are in our professions connecting with human beings and i talk about love a lot because it's it's a counter to that old adage that money makes the world go round. Well, guess what? No, it doesn't. Money talks. No, no, honey, it doesn't. Love talks and people talk with one another and love makes the world go round. You're, you exist because a lot of people throughout history loved each other in one way or another, right? Right. I would say money talks, but 
it's a liar. Don't hmm. listen. It's not worth it. Um, I, my first marriage was to um, a lawyer of some renown, and we had a very wealthy life. And that money never made me healthy. That money didn't save what was a wonderful marriage that got ruined because I was sick and he was burned out. Yeah. That money could not fix that brokenness. The money couldn't never love, you, love you well enough. No, no. I mean... Once you've got your basic needs met, because I will say money is great. Money will get you food. Money will get you shelter. Money will get you clothing. These are so important. Yeah. Once you have those needs met, any extra money isn't going to add to your life. There's a great play called The Matchmaker by Thornton Wilder that later became the musical Hello, Dolly. Um that most people have heard of rather than the play. <laughs> the play is great. <laughs> and there was a film, a movie made of, for, I think in the fifties, brilliant. Everybody should look it up, The Matchmaker. But there's a great line that my grandmother used to quote. This is that same grandmother who told me labels up for food cans. She was awesome. No mistake, her middle name was Pearl because she was always dropping it. She used to say, she used to quote Thornton Wilder. She used to say, honey, money, you should pardon the expression, is like manure. It should be spread around encouraging young things to grow. I love that. Isn't that, I want to get that on a tattoo on my body somewhere because it really is, you know, uh, that, that's been a big shift in my life path is focusing on charitable giving. Um, there are a couple of charities uh, that I support personally. One I founded. Uh, that actually this podcast helps support. Yes. So anybody who wants to be a sponsor, uh, those funds will go to the Lost Travelers Club, which supports mostly supports parents who have outlived their kids and are feeling a bit lost in the world. Um, it's called the Lost Travelers Club, Lost Traveler Podcast. So there's the, the brand. Um, and then the other one is called Desire Child Care Organization in Uganda. And it's this kid, 28 years old, who's the age my son would be now had he lived. And single-handedly, he has essentially adopted, rescued and adopted 32 children out of the slums off the streets of Kampala. And these are kids who were orphaned or children of children, girls who were raped and, you know, uh, at, at very young ages and couldn't sustain, you know, motherhood or being with their child. Right. Um, you know, extreme poverty, abandonment, uh, you know, health care issues, and therefore put out because their parents couldn't afford to treat their sickle cell anemia with. And what an angel on earth, you know, that this yeah. guy adopted these children. And I've been a mentor to him now for most of this year. For years, I've turned on the television and the internet and have felt bombarded with messages of support, begging for money to support children in Africa, Afghanistan, India, all over the world, war-torn countries. Children are starving, not only for food, but for education and love in some cases. Um, I recently connected with Desire Child Care Organization uh, that transforms the lives of orphans and vulnerable Ugandan children in Kampala and Mukono by providing wholesome food, housing, health care, and creative arts education from early childhood to adulthood. Won't you join me in helping save orphans and vulnerable children? We can do it together, one organization at a time. I chose this one. Visit desirechildcare.org for more information. Thank you.
Your generous sponsorship and individual support of the Lost Traveler podcast benefits the Lost Travelers Club, a charitable project under the fiscal sponsorship of United Charitable, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. The Lost Travelers Club focuses primarily on the needs of parents who have outlived their beloved children. We recently launched our new Brain Candy Project Wing, providing art supplies to children still struggling with critical or terminal health-related conditions. We hope to raise enough funds to launch Brain Candy, an arts and literature magazine created by and for these young people. Find out more at www.braincandy.online. Thank you. And, um, you know, we talk about love. We talk about giving of ourselves. We talk about money and how we use it. You know, people, I think right now, it's very easy to hoard. People are anxious. People don't know what the future is going to bring. Right? And we've seen infomercial after infomercial for decades of little black children with flies in their eyes and extended belly and you know nothing's getting better so why should i send my three dollars a month right right how do we how do you think we we need to sort of take responsibility for one another i think you have you know you're on the right track here you volunteering yeah. volunteering will change the world and i don't care where you volunteer go volunteer at the animal shelter volunteer reading to people who are blind um i did that for a while yeah. um i yeah. worked at some animal shelters my greatest volunteer opportunity i worked at a correctional halfway house helping students get their GEDs. Wow. Um, and that actually, they eventually hired me on. And it was the most amazing experience to work with people, felons who were in their 30s, 40s, 50s. I once had a student in his 60s. He wanted to get his GED. Um, go out there, spend five hours a week you can change the world truly true and change yourself your inner world yes <laughs> you oh, know, when we talk you about, change the world the world changes you it talks you know we talk about mental health and we talk about the tools that we have at our you know maybe we can't afford always to go and get a therapist maybe or we don't think we can i mean there are ways to do it there are programs that are funded um, but if you, your only recourse is to go to the library and look things up, you know, there's a stress around that, uh, waiting in line and, and, you know, all those judging eyes on you and all the things that someone might carry, um, even, you know, people who struggle with feeding themselves, going to the food pantry, there's another great organization, the open door uh in in gloucester massachusetts that is like a supermarket they make it it's not like you go in and get a box of moldy fruit i mean it's all fresh it's all and it, because it's a seaport you get fresh fish you get fresh vegetables that people are growing in their gardens and it's it's a gesture from the community to those in need and i found myself one time as a as a theater artist uh, you know, you never know when the money's coming in. <laughs> and a friend of mine said, Henry, go to the open door. Just go, just do it. It's free. It's open to the public. You can go. I said, I don't want to be in the system and I don't want to take away from somebody who really needs it. And they said, well, Henry, you really need it right now. So just go one time, just go. And I did. And it was game changing for me. And I was checking out and the woman said, see you next week because you could go once a week. And I said, I hope not. She said, no, see you next week. Why? Because the more people that use our service, the better funded we get. And we can help even more people. So come and use the service. Even if you don't think you may need it all the time, we need you. 
So that's a that was like a mind expanding moment. Yeah. For me, saying here's a resource. I mean, goodness knows, even with 8 billion people on the planet, there should be no shortage of food. There should be no shortage of health care. There should be no shortage of education that's accessible to any single individual on the planet, you know? And so the more of us that are talking like this, permission is a powerful thing, isn't it? It really is. And someone with and your- self permission toolkit, can change your life. And it does. Your, it does. It's one of the things that will open up a new world to you. So listen, as we're wrapping up, I can't believe we've been talking for an hour already. Wow. Uh, yeah. I know. <laughs> Time and space disappear on the Lost Traveler podcast, I swear. <laughs> and I say this to everybody and really genuinely mean it. We have to have a part two because we haven't talked about enough. There are so many other things that are churning. There's so many things. Yeah. Right? Um, Absolutely. A constant that I always ask my my guests, my co-hosts, uh, as I consider them, um, what are three practical tools in your kit that you can offer to our listeners universally around the world? Not tools that they can use themselves because they're not you, right? But they can right. synthesize with the tools that they already have in their kit and create new tools for themselves. Um, we were just talking about permission. My, yes. my first tool is give yourself permission to be you. Give yourself permission to break from the mold, to do what resonates in your life. That's my first tool. My second tool would be give that permission to other people. Accept them for who they are. Don't judge them by your like or your standards. Judge them by theirs. Or how you were raised. <laughs> or how you were raised. And then I'm going to go with my third one is volunteer. Get out there. Uh, tutor a kid. Um, walk a dog work at the grocery um i'm not sure what you would call that the food pantry grocery store mm -hmm. get out there it will change your life and in the meantime you'll be helping other people that's right helping others really comes back to yourself helping others whether it's with your time with your talent with your money it comes Money. back to you. There's an old witchy thing that's, you know, everything you think and speak and do in the world comes back to you threefold. And that's absolutely true. Don't you think? But I've experienced that. Yes. What you put out in the world comes back. That's right. If you put out that love, that attention, that kindness, it will come back. I've been through some really hard times. And every time people were there for me. And the, when I was like, why, why are you helping me? Because you were there for me. That's it. That's it. Even strangers who don't know you will help. Oh, yes. Oh, you're people putting it up, want right? to help you. They people do. do. If you let people know you're hurting, people will bend over backwards to help you with that. It's just human nature. That is human nature, guys. Not what you're seeing in social media, not what you're seeing on the news, not, you know, government politicians and rulers and fascists and kings and queens. All those things that we're seeing is a very, very small, small, abnormal world that compared to what's real, compared to exactly what you were saying compared to to you know human nature which is to love and be loved that is absolutely nature, is right so i think you know, oh so important. if you're on this side of the road someone's going to stop and help you that's right that's and right they don't know you we, and they, be, they don't be that person be that be person that person first 
right? If you're sitting on a park bench and you look across the way and you see some little old man, a little old lady sitting there and they're looking alone, just go over and sit down next to them and ask them their story. People love talking about their story and, and, and we need to do more of that in the world. And there's That's so great. many great stories. Oh, endless. That's why I'm a theater artist. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. And a podcaster. Thank you for joining yeah. us, uh, listeners. Uh, look in the description for Jennifer Monroe's information, uh, ways to contact her, her website. Um, also, she's going to share with me uh, resources, uh, YouTube and books, um, perhaps somebody who's inspired you that we can share with other people. Keep that love train going um, Absolutely. This, this time and all of your incredible wisdom and your your story, because it's it's a really good one. And I really hope you write that children's book about Thor, <laughs> Thunder Bunny, Traveler of the Universe. Thank you for having me so much. Great. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. You've been listening to season three of the Lost Traveler podcast with your host, Henry Cameron Allen. Visit me online at www.henryallen.org. Thank you to all my guests and thank you to my listeners all around the world. I couldn't do this without your support. Let's keep striving for a better world together. Sometimes I think I live in a gap between two worlds. One world that I have to wake up to, be adherent of the rules and live in a place that is dictated by others. A place I sometimes feel the fear of aging and dying before I have figured out what it is I am here to do. That other world is sweet, fresh and misty, inviting adventure into the unknown, melding ancient wisdom with new discovery, the sunlight turning into moonlight and the spell of eternal life is never broken. Perhaps in that gap, I should repair the forgotten bridge from one side to the other. But truth be told, I don't want to. I don't want to because I don't have the energy to fix what is broken within. I am a wild, wandering nomad. I belong everywhere and nowhere, all at the same time. And in that gap between worlds, I am free. Rita Clint <laughs>